Welcome to Novel Ideas, where we chat with local authors. I'm Carolyn Luck, and here with me is co-host Josh Brogadier. Great to be with you, Carol, as always. And with us tonight is a special guest, Lee McIntyre. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. appreciate the opportunity. We're looking forward to delving into your latest work. But tell us for a moment who you are and um, how you came to be in this area. Um, so uh, I grew up in Portland, Oregon, and uh, I came east for college. I went to Wesleyan University. Mm -hmm. And I met my wife on the first day of college. She was, in fact, the first person I met on the first day. And I was an Easterner ever since. I, I moved out here, and that was it. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> so from Middletown, Connecticut, to obviously now here in, in greater Boston. Right. And you are currently a professor at Boston University? Okay. Uh, I'm a research fellow at okay. the Center for Philosophy and History of Science at BU. Yeah. And I also teach ethics at Harvard Extension School. Nice. Um, so you, from Connecticut to Michigan, back to Oregon for a year, back to Boston, upstate New York, back to Boston. So we, we bounced around a good deal, but ended up in Boston. Nice. Mm -hmm. okay. It yes. sounds like academia. Right. Yes. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yes, you were also um, voted as best teacher, or you received two awards for your teaching. I, I did. Now, what makes, you, what makes a professor so good? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I enjoy <laughs> yeah. teaching. Uh, the the, the uh, one thing that's going on right now is that my uh, position at BU is uh, simply a research uh, fellowship. I don't have to do any teaching. So I, I sought out opportunities to teach. I taught at Simmons College for eight years. I'm now teaching at Harvard Extension because I missed it. I really enjoy my interaction with students and I kind of have that enviable uh, academic spot where I could just do research all the time, but I, I really enjoy teaching. And I think when you enjoy something, you tend uh, tend, tend to do it well and it rubs off on the mm -hmm. students and they like the enthusiasm and it's just I like the spontane spontaneity in the classroom. It's mm -hmm. the best part for me. And clearly mm -hmm. the expectation is that you'll be doing quite a bit of writing. You know, that, that's the expectation of anybody who's at the level that you are. Is that something that you truly enjoy doing or is that just a part of the job? Uh, it, it's, it's what I w always wanted to do. Uh, I, I looked back when my kids were applying to college, we had a laugh. I looked back at my college application, and it had a line that said, "You know, what do you want to, what do you want to do someday, or you know, what's your profession?" And I put writer, and I had forgotten that I'd put that, but that's just sort of how things ended up. I'd, I'd always been interested. I'd always admired uh, writers. I'd always. Uh, I remember uh, in our house, uh, neither one of my parents went to uh, to college, but we always had a lot of books in the house. And we had the World Book Encyclopedia. And I remember reading, as uh, being especially interested in the uh, entries about uh, philosophers, scientists. Those seemed to be the people who got remembered, the people who were writers, the people who were thinkers. Uh, and so I thought, maybe I'll become one of those. Mm -hmm. So. You know, if you were in Portland, Oregon, did you go to Powell's Bookstore as a kid? Uh, I loved it. Uh, <laughs> yes, Powell's Bookstore was my, uh, was my childhood bookstore. Uh, it was not really oh famous when uh, it started out. It was six auto showrooms uh, in downtown uh, Portland on uh, 10th and Burnside, still the same uh -huh. location. Wow. I, I was completely uh, honored this last summer that I had a, a book signing at Powell's Books. So it was my childhood mm -hmm. bookstore, and I got to go back. And uh, the entire front row were my high school teachers. Uh, oh, which was, amazing. Yeah, it, was, it was amazing. And then, and then we went out. Uh, I took them out for, uh, for dinner. I, I had a, a party afterward for friends and family in town. And, uh, and we all went out. And I got to talk to them. So it was, uh, that, that was a dream come true. If, if you had uh, gone back and told me at the time that I'd be giving a book talk at Powell's Book someday, that, yeah. that would have really yeah. surprised me. Yeah, well, people who don't know Powell's Bookstore, this place is huge. It's what five stories high, and it's uh, it's about a million books. Uh, it's as I said six auto showrooms. It's now got five locations. It's it's the largest used bookstore in North America, mm -hmm. uh, one of the largest in the world. Um, it's prob and and they've got new books now too. That's when they started out. They were used books, and then they started to have new books mixed in. It's the kind of place where you can go and. Whoever your favorite author is, they'll have every book by that person, which is mm -hmm. amazing. 
Sure. Well, they have this also antique book room too. They do. That they had to drag me out of when we were up there. <laughs> that's that's actually their green room for uh, the that they use for the for the book talks. So uh, I was poking around in there before my book talk at Pals and. Uh, it, it, it was it was hard <laughs> to get out of there. <laughs> yeah. so looking around. Yes. So with so many authors and so many writers there, is there a style that you have emulated in your work over the years and think this is the person that I, I like the way that they mm -hmm. you know focus their writing? Do you have anyone like that? Um, I I really always admired the, the novelists. Uh, I remember one of my favorite. Uh, my, one of my favorite writers as a kid was George Orwell. Mm -hmm. And it, it really impressed me what he was able to do with just with the written word. And the fact that it was fiction was absolutely incredible. And the joke that I've been making with, uh, with Post Truth is that I always wanted to write a dystopian thriller. I just didn't know it was going to be nonfiction. <laughs> so, and, and I and I quote Orwell quite extensively in the book. And yeah. so I I sort of I mean maybe that was part of my inspiration for wanting to to become a writer. Um, I, I took a, a, it's not really a detour because it was part of the path, but I ended up in philosophy because I wanted to write about ideas. I, I think that was the thing that really appealed to me about Orwell is that it wasn't just fiction about some made up world, it was about ideas, it was about serious topics that mattered. And uh, I still have a great love for uh, dystopian fiction, it's kind of my favorite, uh, my favorite thing to read. The Aldous Huxleys mm. of the world. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and The Handmaid's Tale. Oh, right. Wow. Oh, yeah. 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 Interesting. Yeah. Oh, wow. So you've written eight books, mm -hmm. and these started out very academic. Mm -hmm. So kind of give us a little bit of information about these? Yeah, um, so w when you uh, go to graduate school in philosophy, you very quickly learn that the reward structure is <laughs> that you write for other academics. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I did that. My, my first book was called uh, Laws and Explanation in the Social Sciences. And although I try to write as clearly as I can, it was a book, uh, it was an academic book for, uh, for other academics. And uh, that was terrific, and it went paperback, and I think some people who weren't philosophers of social science also bought it. But it kind of gave me the bug to start writing for a larger audience. I wanted to uh, make my work accessible. I sort of put a premium on being able to write in a, in a clear manner. Uh, I, philosophy's hard. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. philosophy is, is, just, is difficult just as it sits. And it's especially difficult if someone isn't a clear writer. So I admire uh, Wittgenstein and Nietzsche and the people who are you know, very mm -hmm. clear writers. And I thought, well, that's the kind of philosophy, that, that's the way that I want to write. I don't write in the same area that they did. But I'm a philosopher of science. But I, I put a premium on writing clearly. And that just evolved to the point where I finally decided that I wanted to bring serious I, philosophical ideas and the precision of thinking that we have to a larger audience. I just wanted to uh, start to break out of just writing for you know, the other people in my profession and, uh, and, and write in a, um, just bring those ideas out. Uh, Dark Ages, I, I consider, was really my, my breakout book for that. That was um, uh, based on, uh, so that was based on some of the ideas in, um, Laws and Explanation, but it was, uh, the subtitle is The Case for a Science of Human Behavior. So it was really an attempt to make some of the same arguments that I, uh, that I was making in uh, Laws and Explanation for a larger audience. And this came out in 2006 with MIT Press, mm -hmm. and I just got interested in, well, you know, by then I was a, I was a full-time writer, and I thought I can write about anything I want, mm -hmm. and I'm a philosopher. So I'm going to be a philosopher who writes for a general audience. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the response has been good, clearly, because you've yes. continued to do it. It, it has. It, it takes a while. Uh, and, and in philosophy, there's always a little bit of critique for people who want to do what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. uh, I, and at the beginning, there was a little bit more, uh, less so now. I think that, uh, especially in the, the current era, people are, uh, pr professors want to have an influence on the world. Um, they usually take it out on their students in the classroom, you know, if they're not getting on TV <laughs> and they're not getting their op-eds published, but, you know, they've got a, a structured audience there in the classroom. So um, some of that, some of that is behind the critique. 
But I think that one thing that happens is um, there's also a little bit of you know rooting for somebody who has an ambition to to bring academic ideas out. If you do it in a responsible way, if you don't oversimplify, and I chose as an area to write about uh, science denial, which I think is something that a lot of people in my profession in philosophy of science. Uh, are driven crazy by science denial, and so they thought, well, you know, good, there are people doing this. And I'm not the only one. There are other people who are who are trying to to do this uh, as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Well, we uh, that actually started with respecting truth. It did. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So, so the next book after Dark Ages was Respecting Truth, mm-hmm. uh, which came out with uh, uh, Rutledge in 2015, mm-hmm. and I got interested in this. I got interested in the problem of climate change because it seemed to me that you know if if philosophers were going to have any sort of an influence on the world that this was a really big problem and some of the people who were um, pushing back uh, the, the people who were uh, climate change deniers really didn't understand how science worked and this is what I'd been studying for all those years in academics and so as I started to write about this subject I figured out that the question of whether vaccines cause autism, uh, whether uh, evolution by natural selection uh, makes any sense, uh, uh, you know, climate change, all of these things were really related in their roots. And it seemed to me that uh, there, were, it, there were ideological barriers. Uh, dark Ages was about, the, the idea behind Dark Ages was that we're currently in the Dark Ages of social science because political ideology is doing to us today what religious ideology did to natural sciences in Galileo's time. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. I wanted, in Respecting Truth, to write about, well, what is that ide- ideology? What is, what's behind science denial? And so I, uh, I wanted to write about how, how you could uh, intellectually approach people who not only had different ideas, but different argumentative strategies, because they really didn't understand how science worked. And, th- and that's, that's what got me on the kind of the truth kick. Uh, right. I got interested. <laughs> it, it was a, an easy transition from writing about science to writing about truth. And uh, so, so respecting truth was next. And there's a piece of science and science denial in post-truth, which brings me to the point of yep. we actually are going to take a quick break. Mm-hmm. But when we do come back, we're going to talk all about post-truth, which is right. your newest book. And let me tell you, that certainly applies to what's been going on right <laughs> now in the world. Yes. So we'll take a quick break, and we'll be right back with Novel Ideas. Great. It takes less than one minute to find out if you may have prediabetes. You can do it here. But you probably won't. You're busy. Kids, work, show coming back in 48 seconds. So let's do this now. Hold up one finger if you're a man. Women, zero. Three more fingers if you're over 60. Two over 50. One over 40. If you're not sure, keep in mind you're sitting on a couch right now. So one more finger if you're not very active. One finger if yes, zero if no. One yes, zero no. Next, find the body type that looks most like you and hold up that many fingers while I look around awkwardly. And that's it. If you're holding up five fingers or more, you probably have prediabetes. Sorry to be so blunt, but hey, you're busy. Just go to the site. Todd's a great guy. I mean, look at him. What a sweetheart. Attaboy. Wait, Todd, what are you doing? How totally selfish and untod like of you. Come on, Todd. Come on, man. Morning, Gary. We are GetSchooled.com. You want a college education, don't you? You know you do. Uh, yeah, but I don't know where to start. That's why we're here. We're free, handsome, oh, I think we're breathtaking. And here to guide you through every step of the way, starting with attendance. <laughs> Gary, financial aid forms. Biology homework, Chief. I got this. <coughs> Is that brand? <laughs> Oh, 
colleges love extracurricular activities. Uh, chess really isn't my thing. I got this. Doesn't matter. Go ahead. Picking a college, man. You and us we go together like tacos and Tuesday. And I love tacos. Fire and ice. Those don't really go together. Go to GetSchool.com for more info. Welcome back to Novel Ideas. We're here with Lee McIntyre. And before we delve into his book, Post-Truth, we'd like a little bit more information about growing up as a child and how this impacted or influenced uh, where you are today. Right. Well, um, I have the best mom in the world. Hmm? Uh, my mom... I thought I did. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, the thing that I like about uh, the way that I grew up is that my mom uh, always took me seriously. She didn't... Um, just say, you know, don't ask that question or, you know, you shouldn't be interested in that. She always would talk to me, uh, encourage me to ask good questions, which is maybe why I wanted to become a philosopher. I remember asking her one time uh, uh, what the sun was, and she said, well, it's just, it's a star, but it's very close. And then I came back to her a little bit later and said, uh, do the other stars have planets? This was 1967, 68. Mm -hmm. And she said, uh, probably, we just haven't found him yet. Mm -hmm. And that sort of thing really sparks the imagination for a kid. And so that, that, that sort of track of just being taken seriously. And uh, I remember at the height of the Vietnam War, I asked her, uh, I was, my, my brother was Vietnam age, though he, he didn't go, asking her you know, why, why the world was sort of a, such a terrible place. She said, "Someday, she said, somewhere there are great minds working on this, and they'll figure it out." And I always, that always stuck with me, thinking, the great minds must be the people who are the professors, the people who just have time to think all the time. And I want to be one of those guys. So, mm -hmm. kind of from the age of six, that was very appealing to me. It's mm -hmm. an interesting yeah. way to do it. Yeah. So, you also had just we want to talk about this for a moment. Yeah. You recently were at the United Nations. Uh, I, I was, yeah. Not just there as a visitor, of course. Uh, no, it, it was uh, <laughs> it, it was it was really amazing. I, I got a chance to speak at the United Nations. They were having uh, a forum on fake news, and they wanted me to come uh, as part of a panel and uh, uh, and and talk about fake news. Uh, it was a very high security event. Uh, it was uh, kind of more in the way of a, of a briefing for some of the, the journalists and uh, affiliates uh, at the United Nations. It wasn't in the General Assembly. It wasn't in the, the big room. It was in a, a different building. But it was still the United Nations. Oh, yeah. and, it was, uh, and it was wonderful. And it, it, was the, it was a moment there when I felt I, 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 wish, I wish my mom could have seen it. That was, it was wonderful. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Let's jump into post-truth for a moment. and. Um, it's a term that I think people can understand, but maybe when they hear it are not exactly sure mm -hmm. what it means. Can you tell us what it is? Yeah, so I think of post-truth, uh, I guess the easiest way to think of it is in contrast to something. People get post-truth confused with other things. And some people will say, well, isn't post-truth just fake news or just lying or just propaganda or something like that? And I think of it this way. Uh, lying is the intentional misrepresentation of fact. And spin is when you're presenting the facts in the most favorable way. In both of those cases, you're trying to convince somebody that what you're saying is true. And you're still um, you're, you're, you're dealing with facts in one way or another, even if you're misrepresenting them. I think of post-truth as entirely political. Uh, post-truth is the subordination of reality for political purposes. So it's, it's much more insidious than um, e even than lying, because I think that when you're lying to somebody, you're at least trying to convince them to believe you. With post-truth, I think that the point is to dominate them. I think that the, the best way to think of post-truth is uh, subordination of reality for the purpose of political dominance, and which is a very scary thing. Uh, Tim Snyder, who wrote the book On Tyranny, said that post-truth is pre-fascism, and I think he's right. Mm. Mm. So is this something that you see as just very recent, or where would you put this in time? Um, Post-truth has roots that go back uh, not, not only 50 years, but probably to the, the dawn of humanity. Uh, in the book, I talk about uh, some of the roots being science denial, uh, science denial going back to uh, 
uh, the denial of the linkage between uh, smoking and cancer in the 1950s as part of a coordinated public relations campaign put on by the tobacco companies. Uh, that the, the tobacco strategy worked all the way up through um, uh, climate change. Uh, and and I, I think in some ways that post-truth is just the metastasis of that. It's science denial was so effective at denying fact that people looked at it and said, well, we could do, if we can do that for the truth about uh, all of these scientific topics, we can do it about whether the crime rate is going up or down. We can do it about uh, whether or not the um, stock market closed the day after 9-11 or not. We can do it for anything. Um, other roots are cognitive bias, these you know, wired in pathways in the human brain, um, kind of the perfect storm of the decline of traditional media and the rise of social media. All of these things came together um, to really to create this very contemporary problem of post-truth. Uh, lying political dominance, these go back a good way in human history, mm -hmm. but this feels very new, uh, especially in American politics, where people aren't even embarrassed anymore when they're caught in a lie. And, and there are no consequences for the lie. That's an important aspect of post-truth as, as well. Post-truth, it's, it's not that we're beyond truth because nobody cares about it, it's sort of the sense that there, there's no price to be paid for not caring about reality and truth uh, anymore. In other words, there's so much support for what might be said that it's not a matter of backpedaling or the need to backpedal. That's right. Because a group mm -hmm. will jump in and say, That's right. this is going to support the position that I already have preconceived notions about, and it's just yeah. making that happen. It, it, it goes back to Orwell. Right. If you can't prove that something, if, if something really happened, but you have no proof for it, or if something really happened but everybody agrees that it didn't, did it really? It, it's, a, it's, a, mm -hmm. it's a scary moment. I remember the scene in uh, 1984 where he's, he's holding a piece of paper that proves that something is wrong that he just wrote about and he puts it in the memory hole and then it's gone. It, it's, it's a very, I remember that mm -hmm. being a very powerful mm -hmm. moment reading 1984. Yeah. And I, I think that that's somewhat where we are with post-truth, where politicians can lie with impunity because they know that millions and millions of people will agree with them and there will be no consequence. Well, with, you know, the sense of cognitive bias, there's also this big emotional piece that comes along with it. Mm -hmm. uh, would you speak to that a little bit? Or? Um, so cognitive, so uh, um, cognitive bias is just these, these wired in pathways from evolution that help us to uh, make decisions quickly. Thinking is very slow. Uh, Daniel Kahneman wrote a book, a terrific book, called Thinking Fast and Slow. So rational thought is very slow. And if you only relied on rational thought, you'd get eaten by a tiger. I mean, things would have happened in the primordial environment. So believing in the truth, there's great evolutionary advantage to believing in true things. But there's also great evolutionary advantage to jumping to a conclusion very quickly sometimes. And so some of those cognitive biases are wired in for very good reason. It's just that they feel like thinking, but they're not. And so it's, it, it, it satisfies our emotions sometimes to believe that something's true even when it's not true. Uh, that those pathways maybe served us very well when we needed to jump to conclusions about things that were safe or not safe in a primordial environment but it, it can get in the way. You alluded to the security needed at the United Nations a little while ago. Mm -hmm. Has your book been received as pro-Trump versus anti-Trump by a lot of people, or are they not seeing it that way? They're seeing more of the yeah. bigger picture of post-truth rather than just right. sort of the alternative facts, fake news that we keep hearing about. Yeah, I, I make a point in the book of saying that Trump wasn't the cause of post-truth, he was the result. Um, and I, I do have a lot of examples in the book from things that Trump has said and you know, from the, uh, mm -hmm. the last uh, uh, two years of his presidency. And I really I make no apologies for that. And I say so at the beginning of the book that it's not a partisan book, but I don't, I, I don't want to indulge in false equivalence. Mm -hmm. Because to indulge in false equivalence is itself a form of post-truth. To pretend mm -hmm. that it's all equal when it's not to say, well, I'm going to have a chapter on the 
lies that Trump told, but also a, a chapter on the lies that Obama told. It, to, you know, to, to try to pretend that it's equal or that, that a false objectivity, mm -hmm. I don't think really does justice to it. Uh, the media gets caught in that mm -hmm. a lot. Mm -hmm. the, the media, uh, you see it in scientific debates where they want to be so careful that they don't sound like they're biased, and so they'll, uh, climate change is a good example. They'll put up somebody who's a NASA scientist like James Hansen, mm -hmm. and they'll put up a climate change denier, equal size picture on the screen, the equal time to talk, and the host won't mediate between the two of them. That's not good. That's, that's called objectivity bias. Uh, 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 journalists shouldn't be indifferent between the truth and a lie. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't want to do that in post-truth. Mm -hmm. Most of the examples of post-truth uh, these days come from the right, and I call that out. I was going to say, would you read us a sample yeah. from your book? Yeah. We'll Absolutely. Make sure we don't yeah. run out of time yeah. here and we can okay. hear some of it. Thank you. Yeah. We should never assume that any claim is too outrageous to be believed. A lie is told because the person telling it thinks there's a chance that someone will believe it. We might hope that the listener has enough common sense not to believe it, but in an age of partisan manipulation and fragmentation of our information sources, keyed to play on our motivated reasoning, we're no longer entitled to that assumption. The point of challenging a lie is not to convince the liar, who's likely too far gone in his or her dark purpose to be rehabilitated. But because every lie has an audience, there may still be time to do some good for others. If we don't confront a liar, will those who have not yet moved from ignorance to willful ignorance just slip further down the rabbit hole toward full-blown denial, where they may not even listen to facts or reason anymore? Without a counter-narrative from us, will they have any reason to doubt what the liar is saying? At the very least, it's important to witness a lie and call it out for what it is. In an era of post-truth, we must challenge each and every attempt to obfuscate a factual matter and challenge falsehoods before they're allowed to fester. Mm, very nice. So I also uh, read something that you're working on a novel. I am. <laughs> I've, I've been. Can you uh, let er that cat out of the bag. <laughs> Orwellian novel. <laughs> or no. <laughs> no. So I, I love detective fiction. I love I love crime fiction. I'm a member of uh, Mystery Writers in America. Nice. And I, I haven't published my debut novel yet. But uh, what I'm interested in, I've always been, you know, I've been interested in fiction from an early age. Um, I enjoy having two projects at once. And when I started to write. Uh, nonfiction for the general public, I thought, I, I want to have another project, and the other project turned out to be a novel. So I've always got two things uh, going on at once, and uh, the fiction has uh, taken a, a, little bit <laughs> a little bit longer, and the nonfiction has, uh, has done better. But I have to say that learning how to write fiction has helped me to write nonfiction, because uh, writing narrative, in philosophy, it's so argument-based, but one thing that I've learned with narrative nonfiction is sometimes you convince people with a story. Mm -hmm. And there's yeah. also a, an idea in fiction, a show, don't tell. So I do a little bit more of that now than I used to. Wonderful. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I think it's about time for us to wrap up. We could probably talk Great. a few more hours here. Easily. <laughs> <laughs> so, so wonderful to have you on the show. Thank you. We really appreciate Thank you for your being coming. here. Yeah. I appreciate the opportunity. Yes. Thanks yeah. very much. And Lee McIntyre's uh, website is leemacintyrebooks.com. So you can go check out even more of the exciting things that he's got in store for us. And uh, we're looking forward to your next books. Yeah, thank and, you. Uh, thank you everyone here at Access Framingham for making this show possible. And thanks to our viewers for joining us for Novel Ideas. We'll see you next time. All right. Good night.